Okay. Hello. So today I'm going to be recording my period six lecture as a regular YouTube video because the live stream is acting all tetchy. Get once attention. So do it this way. And this way, at least you people at home will be able to see what you're supposed to see. Good. Stupid machines. Uh, first off, welcome. I took your attendance, right? I hate yeah. technology. I hate technological problems. Uh, so I'm dealing with a little bit of emotional stuff. In ancient and medieval history, you're going to learn the story of how we come from savagery, a grunt of tree-dwelling primitive men, to civilization. How we learn to control ourselves so that we don't kill each other because we're so damn irritating. How we go from huddling in a cave without fire to uh, putting men on the moon, which we did. My father-in-law was personally involved. You're going to learn also not only how human beings come from uh, savagery to civilization, you're going to learn how people developed our own Western civilization. As much as you may admire the uh, native tribes, our culture, whatever your genetics are, does not come from the Algonquins, the Iroquois, the Coeur d'Alene, the Nez Perce, the uh, Sioux, or any of the other native tribes. Our culture comes from England, Western Europe, the Roman Empire, Christian faith, the Roman Republic, Greece, and to a lesser degree, Egypt and Mesopotamia. We're going to study the origins of this Western civilization because it is our own civilization. It is where we come from, where our institutions come from. But we're also going to study Western civilization because the West is the only society on Earth that developed concepts of freedom, functional concepts of political freedom that allow uh, 300 plus million Americans to live in a state of liberty that really is not possible in most places throughout historical time and on most places in the world today. The West develops the notion of the value of the individual in such a way that we develop functioning freedom. Furthermore, the West is the only society on Earth to industrialize itself. And with the technology that we develop from industry, we develop a lifestyle that expands the natural human uh, lifespan from somewhere between 20 and 25 years on average, a life that is literally short, mean, and brutal, to lifespans in the developed world in the 70s and 80s for men and women. That's no accident. That's a result of the Western approach to industry and enterprise. Finally, what about the non-Western world? Well, we'll be studying the non-Western cultures that Europe encounters. But uh, we'll be studying them as they are discovered by, well, yeah, as they encounter the West. But all of these cultures, and you'll learn about this next year in European history, are eventually con discovered by the Europeans, contacted by the Europeans, traded with by the Europeans, and conquered <laughs> by the Europeans. <sighs> to the point where now in sub-Saharan Africa, Zimbabwe, in the People's Republic of China, and everywhere else on Earth, including the uh, North Koreans, the leader of a country will put on a Western tailored suit, maybe with a tie, maybe with a Mao collar. They'll go on television and they will have a speech, maybe followed by a news conference style question and answer session. These are all things developed by and in the West. So the non-Western world has been Westernized. And the history of every country on Earth is pre-European contact, the era of European imperialism, and post-European contact, three eras everywhere on Earth. So for these and other reasons, it is quite critical that you understand Western civilization. It's your own, 
It develops modern technology, ideas of freedom, and it has uh, affected every other society on Earth. Before we go on, I'll tell you also, I am aghast and horrified that you have to wear those horrible face coverings. I really am. I went to the Panhandle Health meeting that had them made their decision. I was third in line. They still didn't ask me to speak, and they made their vote. And uh, two days later, I was in the streets in my first large-scale peaceful protest, protesting masks, which I believe are completely ineffective against coronavirus. But at the same time, I believe that uh, uh, it's symbolic. And it's an infringement on my freedom of choice. But because of their decision and because of other things, you have to wear that thing, which is uncomfortable, all through my class. Even though I could spread you out so that you probably have at least six feet of space all around you. But the rules are the rules. Each of you in life are going to be faced with moments between doing the right thing and doing the easy thing. I've been faced by that on several occasions. And on several occasions, uh, I've left my job. My employer asked me to do something that went against my principles and my conscience, and I quit. I tried fighting against it as long as I could. It wasn't an immediate or casual decision. Throwing my family into financial turmoil is not something I, I do casually. But on at least three major occasions, I gave up very good jobs, very well-paying, very uh, status, yeah, high status, and... I did it because the employer asked me to do something I just thought was wrong. I wasn't going to do it. That is a choice that you have. I thought about the mask issue, and honestly, it doesn't rise to the level of something I need to resign over. Since I accept the coin of the Coeur d'Alene Charter Academy, I go along with the rules, and that means that you have to sit there with your nose and mouth covered by a piece of cloth or paper. Sorry. It's not what I would want. I will say, though, that considering how valuable you are to your parents, however you may get along with them at this moment, there's nothing more valuable in their lives than you and any siblings that you have. You're the most precious thing in the world to them. They're choosing to risk you in a face-to-face -face environment for the sake of your future and your education, quality of the experience, and all that stuff. But they're gambling with literally the most precious thing in the world to them. And if a little symbolism will help them do that, will help you do that, maybe it is worth it after all. Maybe I'm wrong about the other thing. It's been known to happen. In any case, I regret the discomfort that you're having to go through. But it's 2020. It's a crazy year. History, as you lo will learn, is replete with years where everything seems to be like thrown up in the air. Like taking a, a puzzle and winging it up in the air. And when it falls, it's all scattered and you've got to restart it again. 2020 may be a year like that. Online learning is a lot like watching a fireplace on YouTube. You'll get some of the light and none of the warmth. What I do is a lot like a comedian, a stand-up comedian, although I'm less funny. What I do is a lot like an actor who prefers acting in plays to acting on screen. I like an audience. The give and take with an audience is what makes it interesting. It's what makes face-to-face -face for learning uh, alive and vibrant. You guys online aren't getting that. You're not getting the same in-person thing. Now, I've, I've done YouTube videos. I know what it's like to project my personality through the screen and beyond. But the truth is, it's not the same as being here. Every other day, you're going to have to learn in that different environment. Sorry. But getting you here part of the time is better than none of it. The board notes for ancient history are on this side. They're like a great skeleton. They'll show you the structure of what I'm going to say. You at home have access to the uh, printed files, uh, which includes the Unit 1 notepad, and you have 
if you're here, you're going to be getting the unit one note pack. What I'm going to do with my lecture is I'm going to add the sinew, the cartilage, the muscles, the blood system, the nervous system, the skin, the hair, the sweat glands, all of it, the life. So as I speak, what I expect you to do is write notes down to help you remember what it is I'm saying. That's your job, or at least part of your job. So the notes will be on the board. But normally, the camera angle that people will have is much less felicitous to seeing the notes behind me. Normally, the camera angle is going to be from over there, and it's going to be oblique. You're going to have to use your note packs and write things down as you're taking notes. Those of you online, it would also be a good idea to do the check-in. Google Classroom is where uh, you will find your assignments. It's where you'll, where you'll find these videos. And when I send messages when you're not here in person, that's where I'll send them. So check your Google Classroom account for history every day. This is your sixth class on the first day, perhaps, for many of you of high school. And it's crazy. 2020, what a year. And we're not done yet. And there are other things that could happen. I suspect that many of you, if you haven't already, are seriously thinking about transferring to Lake City or CHS or Timberlake or some Christian school or Idaho Virtual or homeschooling because of the mountain of work, the ridiculous expectations that we teachers have. I'm asking for your patience. None of us have done this before. I've been teaching history full time for 20 years, beginning of my 20th year, 21st year, actually. I've been in classrooms as a teacher since October of 1984, but I've never done this. What I did last spring was nothing like this. None of your teachers have. This hybrid model is completely new. So what I did is probably what a lot of your teachers did. I set up a full-scale syllabus with all the work that you would normally have. If I find that what we're doing is just, that's not appropriate, that's too much work, I'll reduce it. I will attempt to be reasonable because you guys deserve that. You should get the amount of work that will help you learn history and develop your skills, not an amount of work that is an exercise in sadism or masochism. So... Your other teachers, I expect, will be doing the same thing. Whether they talk about it as bluntly as I do or not, I expect that they're going to be tweaking what they do, calibrating it. I certainly will. There's also the sheer power of gut liquefying fear. Fear is a good thing in its proper place. Fear prevents us from going up to a grizzly bear with a marshmallow in our mouth going, Here, grizzly, here, gentleman. <laughs> because the thing about grizzlies that you really need to understand is even if they're in a good mood, and even if they want to take the marshmallow from your mouth, they're clumsy. And they'll take your face off, probably, just to get the marshmallow. And walking around without a face is unpleasant. Human beings do that. There are people who actually suffer horrible accidents and they lose their face, which is a big deal. That's so terrible. It is. Don't ever... Let a grizzly bear eat from your mouth. It's a stupid thing. And you know what will prevent you from doing that? Fear. Fear is good. Fear clarifies. Fear helps prevent us from doing stupid, self-destructive things. Fear is good, to a point. But our patterns have been so disrupted, and this is all so new to everyone, that it may must feel like being at the base of a 300-foot granite slab of cliff. You've got to climb that cliff at night in the rain. CHS won't make you do that. Lake City won't make you do that. Lakeland won't make you do that. It'll be much easier if you go there. I want to keep you all here. All of you. I want you to succeed. And I think you can. If you, among other things, master your fear. Nobody climbs a cliff 300 feet at a time. You climb a cliff two or three feet at a time. One step at a time. What if there was an evil fascist pizzeria owner? Hey, you! You're going to eat this extra-large pizza in a one gulp! 
It's my Italian voice. And what's the problem with that? Think about how big an extra large pizza is. Even if you rolled it up and used a compactor, the moment that the pizza entered your mouth and was no longer being compacted by the compacting machine, it would make your head into a clown car. And then you'd be dead. Because there simply aren't enough cubic centimeters inside your skull to contain a rolled up extra large pizza. It is impossible for a human being to eat a pizza that's extra large in one gulp. But pizza doesn't seem that dangerous to us, usually. You don't think about the chance of your head exploding if you eat pizza. Oh, don't order pizza. It's so horrible. <laughs> Haven't you ever heard? So the reason uh, that we eat pizza with relative safety is, well, we cut it into pieces. And then each piece is sliced with a fork and knife and brought to our mouth if we're civilized, or ripped out by your teeth if you're a barbarian. And then we masticate, we chew. And that chewed pizza goes in tiny morsels into our stomach, which is then beaten up by our stomach muscles and uh, liquefied by our stomach acids to become nutrients that flow through our bloodstream and nutrify our cells and keep us alive. Tasty, tasty. This mountain of work that you're going to get is going to seem daunting. I'm sure it does seem daunting, terrifying, and fearful. If it doesn't yet, well, remember, I'm going to show you, and I suspect your other teachers will too, how to do this in bite-sized pieces. We'll learn if you keep trying. We'll learn if you master your fear. But it's a crazy year. That's a heck of a way to start high school. There's something else. I didn't in this class for whatever reason, but usually I refer to the virus that we're facing as the Chinese communist virus or the Wuhan flu. Now, why do I do this? Especially since some people think it's racist. Well, I do this because the normal nomenclature of diseases identifies the source. 101 years ago, we faced the Spanish flu. Not because we hate Spanish people, but because the flu, which came from the trenches, first appeared in Spain. And we call it the Spanish flu. Even the most liberal progressive people in media were calling it the Wuhan coronavirus back in January and February, before they decided that that was somehow a slight against the Chinese. I usually call it the Chinese communist virus for a few reasons. Number one, as we understand it, this bat-transmitted coronavirus was first spotted in a Wuhan uh, wet meat market, less than two blocks, city blocks, away from China's premier germ warfare facility, which happens to specialize in bat-transmitted coronaviruses. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence. More than that, the Chinese Communist Party knew about the coronavirus months before anyone else did, and they suppressed the information. Had they done their damn jobs as a government, they would have kept it as a regional epidemic. But their choice to suppress the information like it was political dissent created a global pandemic, which is what we're facing now and why you've got to wear those annoying masks. So I give responsibility where it's due, blame it on them, not because I think they started it on purpose, but because I think they lost control of it and rather than admit it and deal with it, chose to brush it under the carpet. Can't do that with certain things. I call it the Wuhan flu sometimes because it comes from Wuhan, its point of origin, just like the Spanish flu. But that might trigger some of you if you really, really, really want to bend over backwards to avoid seeming racist. Or you may recall in the one of my opening lectures that I gave you on video that I talked about trees just being a crop, and if you need more paper, you grow more trees, harvest more crops like wheat. Well, if you are a dedicated and passionate environmentalist, that might have cheesed you off. When I did the room tour video, one of the things I said that was controversial was I talked about the quote on the outside of the door. And the quote on the outside of the door is by, by Camille Paglia, one of the few feminists I respect because she's intellectually honest. One of the few feminists? If you consider yourself to be a feminist in some way, oh, that's going to cheese you off. This is on purpose. A, I'm evil. You'll see that. But B, 
I am teaching history, which is the study of how we faced crises that affect what we think is worth living for, what we think is worth dying for, and what we might think is worth killing for. And these things are not easy to be uh, to agree to disagree about. For one person's truth to be real, another person's truth needs to be false. This is stuff that people fight over, sometimes wage war over, or have religious persecution over. But we have the same thing today. For history to be interesting, a living connection needs to be there between the crises and controversies of the past and of the present. We don't change. From Grob the Caveman to Captain Kirk the Spaceman, we don't change. Did I talk to you guys in this class about fire yet? No, I don't think so. No, that's not the same. Okay. So, around an ancient campfire, you've got these stinky, sweaty savages chopping on rocks, and Grod looks up and says to Throck, Hey, Throck, what, Grod? Fire. It's awesome. Terrifying. Remember last week? We lit fire in forest, and wind carried fire to Great Cliff, and from Great Cliff it rained meat! And we ate better than ever before because of rain of meat, because the animals in that part of the forest had been driven over the cliff, and they chose to jump rather than burn to death, and the people got to eat their meat. Mm -hmm, good. Yum. But remember Thrisk? Thrisk got caught in fire. Thrisk is now Crispy Critter. Thrisk is now dead, because fire is unpredictable. Well, it's true. The first weapon of mass destruction human beings bring under their control to the extent we control it is fire. But today, let's talk about atomic and nuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs and atom bombs. You might feel guilty as an American because our country is the only country in the history of man to uh, drop atom bombs on human beings. Yep, we did it. I don't feel the slightest bit of guilt for a few reasons. Number one, I'm not President Harry Truman, nor am I Colonel Paul Tibbetts. President Truman was the man who made the decision to drop the bombs. Colonel Tibbetts dropped the first bomb, Little Boy, a boy on the Naval Academy city of Hiroshima. I didn't do it. I'm not going to take on someone else's guilt. I've got enough sins of my own to deal with. But number two, if you are a person who tends to feel uh, some degree of cultural guilt over that, remember that the Japanese did not surrender after we destroyed Hiroshima. It took not one, but two atom bombs. Only after Nagasaki, the only Christian city in, city in Japan, was destroyed, did the Japanese come to surrender. Only then was the emperor willing to concede. The atom bombs saved the Japanese people. Here's how. Every estimate, and I mean every estimate, conservative and hopeful, say that we would likely have lost one million American dead in the initial year or two of invading Japan. That's not dead, wounded, missing. That's dead. We're talking many millions of casualties, but over one million dead. And it's also likely that the entire Japanese race, except for a few thousand survivors, would have wiped itself out in defense of their living god, who they really believed was worthy, as any god would be, of their total devotion. The atom bomb saved Japan from that, and it saved us from that. It's complicated. Also, the fear of the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb has kept the peace longer than any time in modern history. It's one of the longest periods of unbroken peace in human history. We've had small and medium-sized wars since World War II ended in 1945, but no major war. Why? Because the Soviets and we were terrified of a nuclear war. It could end all civilization. It could end all life on Earth. Hopefully the Chinese communist leadership is just as afraid of it as we once were. Because the world is getting interesting again. But the fear of atomic Armageddon has kept the peace. And has created the greatest expansion in the quality of human life around the world in human history. Atomic bombs and fire are different. But the dilemma of using a tool that is both awesome and terrifying is the same as the savages faced when they were thinking about fire. 
that's the truth of history. And so we're going to talk about controversies. And sometimes I'll be very overt about it. I'll lay out a case and then I'll ask you what you think. And all of you at some point or other is going to speak about this. I have a method of extracting information from you. I also have a, a hope that you'll volunteer information and your opinion. But sometimes I'll say things from my antediluvian dinosaur perspective, my conservative perspective. I'm a lousy Christian, but I do have a basic Judeo-Christian perspective. And it's designed, you know, I, I, I'm one of those people that believes there are two genders. I, I equate gender and sex. So I'm going to say things like that. And if that irritates you, that's on purpose. It's not because I'm trying to mess with you. It's because I'm trying to get you to raise your hand and offer your opinion. Criticize my logic. Criticize my reasoning. Offer another point of view. Be respectful and clear about what it is you're trying to argue. Argue what you believe. I never want people to knuckle under and uh, act like they believe what I believe. That's nonsense. I know what it feels like to be in a class like that. I had... Card-carrying communist professors at Bates College. I know because they showed me their commie ID cards. They have Communist Party USA ID cards with numbers and everything. And they punished me for not being liberal, progressive, or socialist, or communist. My grades suffered. I'm never going to do that to you. I don't want you to agree with me. I want you to think for yourself. And since the types of dilemmas that human beings face are basically the same as they ever were, I'm going to connect then and now to controversies then and now. And it will only be fun, and it will only work if you are willing to take the chance of offering your genuine opinion. But we live in a time of cancel culture. So I'm telling you, and I hope I will earn your trust, so that you will feel comfortable doing that. Some of the best relationships I've had with students have been with pagans, with lesbians, with uh, homosexuals, with uh, atheists, agnostics, communists, anarcho-syndicalists. Uh, I never had a fascist, but I'm sure there, there are people, I, I, I'm sure I get along with them. People who believe there are 97 and three quarters genders. People who believe that everything I think is wrong and everything I, you know, everything I think that everything they think is wrong. But it works, and we have good discussions, because we accept one thing. Our ideas are our opinions. Everyone has an opinion. Like most everyone has a nose, except for those poor people without faces. Everyone else has nose. Opinions are like noses. Everyone's got one. Doesn't mean I'm right. Doesn't mean you're right. The first step of a fanatic is to accept the notion that our ideas are right and that anyone who disagrees with our ideas must be either stupid or evil. Once you make that step of assuming the objective truth of your personal opinion, you're on your way to being a zealot, a fanatic, a dangerous person. Because instead of acknowledging that good, smart people might disagree with you on a fundamental issue, you just assume that they're stupid or evil, that they're dumb or bad. It's a bad way to go. So I hope we will talk about these things respectfully. When you express your opinion, I'm not going to go, ooh, ah, thank you. What I am going to do is take what you say seriously. I will treat it with respect, and I may ask you a follow-up question or two. I don't need to win every argument. I don't need to persuade you of anything. My goal is to get you to talk thoughtfully about the controversies then and now. So having said all of that, if I have, in fact, provoked or irritated you by some of the offhand comments I've purposely made to do that, and you wish to offer your opinions on other, on other ideas or other approaches, I humbly invite you to raise your hand and have at it. Sir? Was the span was, I thought the Spanish... Flu did not originate in Spain, but it, Spain was most affected. 
That's the right. flu came from the trenches. Ultimately, when you have millions of men living and dying in basically graves that are being churned up for four and a half years, nasty, nasty viruses are going to come. But yeah, you're probably right. Uh, but it is still called the Spanish flu because of the regionalization of it. Calling it the Chinese flu, I've never thought is racist, uh, but it's not, you know, that, but 2020, you know, it's different today. You know, people have got to be politically correct, people who aren't me. But yes, you're right. Other other opinions or, or thoughts or expressions of how annoyingly wrong I, I am is... Do you have your hand? Um, yeah. Uh, so, I won't deny that trees are crops, but the problem is there's not a whole lot of room to grow said trees in order to harvest them for paper without destroying crucial ecosystems. Well, I'm a believer... You can't exactly regrow a whole ecosystem. Yeah, no, you, you, have a, you have a good point. To me, I've known people who've grown trees as crops in Maine and in Idaho. And the money that they make growing trees does allow them to put money back into the land to fight tree diseases and to make sure the undergrowth doesn't get so thick that if there is, or should I say, when there is a forest fire, the fire doesn't burn too hot. Managed woodlands are actually much safer and better for the trees that are grown there. Just like a cow is, uh, who grows up in a, a free range environment is gonna have an easier life than a deer who grows up in the woods. Um, but yes, uh, you don't want to completely destroy natural woodlands, and I would never argue that. Yeah. I'm just, you know, for those people who do grow the trees. But yeah. you were saying, do you, do you wish I had anything else? Uh, no. Okay. What some people would say about gender is uh, gender is a social construct. That's the argument I've heard again and again. Sex is a biological reality, male, female, a few hermaphrodites, which are people who are born in some mutated way. Uh which is not a criticism, it's just a, it's a description. But that gender is somehow different than biological sex. Central Asian tribes had a custom called the will man. If a female wanted to live like a man when she's at uh, her adolescence, around 12 or 13, she can volunteer to go through the manhood ritual. Now, there's no special male and female standards. The, male, the, the manhood ritual is a life or death struggle. But if she survives the manhood ritual and comes back, from that point on, she'll be treated like a man. She'll get to have a wife. She'll get to hunt. She'll get to she'll get to do everything a man does, and she'll be expected to fight. She may be a small, weak man, but she'll be treated like a man. Uh, so there's a case of gender and sex being different because of culture. One of the interesting questions to me is. Uh, let's imagine that you do think of yourself as something other than your biological sex. Fine, it's America, land of the free, explore life. But do you insist that I call you by a pronoun? Moreover, do you insist that I immediately recognize you as what you think you are rather than what you seem to be? Or do you lose it and start screaming at me because I assumed your gender? Well, I'm gonna assume your gender. And if you wanna tell me otherwise, come talk to me. We'll have a nice conversation as long as you're not being hysterical. I don't believe in it. But I'm a polite enough fellow that I'm not going to go out of my way to offend someone unless they try to insist that I use their terms. That's oppression. I'm not going to cave under the threat uh, or intimidation of somebody insisting that I see the world like they see it. To me, they have a right to see themselves as they want. They do not have a right to insist that I talk, talk to them in the way they would want to be talked to. They have a right to ask. I have a right to say yes or no. That's freedom to me. But does anyone have anything else? That was that was another attempt to sort of encourage comments. But it is the first day of school. And you are all tired. I can see that. I'm tired too. Okay, each of you are going to come up here in a moment. I'm going to call you in alphabetical order. We're going to start with this pile here. Take these two books, take these books, and then we'll go over here because I'm going to give these books out in order. Uh, when you come up, not only take the books, take this, take this, take this. These are all ancient history papers. So, uh, Ms. Adams, come up. And uh, Ms. Clemens, is she not here, is she? Jaylee Clemens? Uh, I guess she's not. So you have number what? Says it right there. 
16, 169. Got it. Go ahead and take those things. Which three? On the Go left. Uh, so, Ms. Fitzgerald, followed by Ms. Kenner. Ms. Fitzgerald, is this you? Okay. So, would you two please take 16, is that 168? Yep. Okay. And take these three things over there. 168. And Ms. Kenner, you're taking 16, 170. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Laster. And uh, behind him, Ms. Uh, Rosco. So, Mr. Laster, you're going to be taking uh, 16, 171. And Ms. Rosco. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay. You got what number? 172. Mr. Euler and Ms. Roop, you already have the book. Mm -hmm. So what what is your number? Repeat. What's the number? 16-141. Got it. Okay, did you take your papers then? You should do no. that. What number uh, do you have? 16-173. Thank you, Mr. Roop. Okay, Ms. Schultz, Belgard, not here. Uh, Ms. Shepard, followed by Mr. Smith. 16129. 16129. Got it. And that is from another class? or That's correct. Okay, so repeat. Okay, uh, Ms. Shepard, what do you have? 16174. Got it. Thank you. Four. Okay, Ms. Tucker, Ms. Wheeler, Ms. Young. And anyone else who I didn't call. So, Ms. Tucker first, is that you? Okay. So, Ms. Tucker, you're going to be getting 16,175, it looks like. Ms. Wheeler, you have 176. Is Autumn Young here? No. Is there anyone here who has not yet been called? No. So, you all have your books. Good. Okay. Last thing. Actually, second to last thing. Right now, all of you are signed up for honors. Honors is like AP for sophomores. Honors is harder. When I set up the course, I had you all set up for honors, but many of you are going to want to shift down to college preparatory. You're still going to have a lot of work in CP, but it's not quite as much as honors. You're going to have from now until next Thursday at 3 p.m. to make this decision. I suggest you think about it and talk with your families. In the packets and documents I've given you, I'm showing you what is different between honors and AP. For example, honor, uh, honors and CP. Honors essays are a little bit more in-depth than the essays you'll be doing as part of your normal chapter survey if you're in college preparatory. I'm going to give the same lectures that I give to both groups. I have, I'll have both types of students in here. But many of you will look at this and say, I'm not ready to do honors right now, in which case you come talk to me, and I will have you switched by the end of next week. You have until the end of next week to make this decision. Uh, honors or college preparatory. And you will, sh you will let me know, and I will then let uh, Ms. Wasson know, who's the guidance counselor, who can switch you over. If you have questions, come talk to me. I hope many of you stay in honors because uh, you'll learn a lot about writing and you'll get to do a lot more in depth with the history. Uh, but trust me, CP is going to work hard too. My job is to challenge and prepare you and I take that job seriously, but also to interest your, excite your interest in history, which I hope I'll also do in the midst of offending you and being a jerk. Um, so come see me if you have questions. You have this week and next week to choose. Uh, talk to your folks. Sleep on it. Let me know. I do expect many of you are going to shift to college preparatory to see people. Finally, here you sit in your seat in room A10, southernmost of the two rooms of the northern modular of the two modulars to the east of the high school building on the northern half, the high school half, of the campus of Coeur d'Alene Charter Academy, which is located in the northwestern region of Coeur d'Alene City, 
uh, part of Kootenai County in the Idaho Panhandle between Washington and Montana. In the sovereign state of Idaho, which is part of the Pacific Northwestern region of the contiguous 48 states that make up the majority of the United States of America, central third of the North American continent, which as we all know is part of the northern and western hemispheres of planet Tellus, Terra, Sol 3, or the Earth! Third of four inner or rocky planets orbited by a big old shielding moon of a nine planet system digress Tyson Pluto's a planet our star system the solar system is uh, part of the local star cluster which is part of the local star super cluster which is part of the Orion spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy at the heart of the local galactic system or orbited by two small galaxies greater and lesser Magellanic clouds which is part of the local galactic cluster, which is part of the local galactic super cluster, which is part of uh, countless galactic super clusters that make up the fabric of uh, the, constant, the continuum of space time. One of potentially infinite dimensions and planes of the macrocosmic all that is reality. In other words, space, it's big. Now let's think about time. Greek Christians believe the Earth is 7,800 or so years old, at toy cosmu, based on the creation of the Earth that the theologians uh, determine, God says, let there be light. If you believe in Big Bang physics, not Sheldon or Leonard, uh, the <laughs> universe is between 14 and 15,000 million or billion years old. Time is long. But in time, each of us has a uniqueness in our moment. You're different than you were a year ago, five years ago, than you will be a year from now, or five years, or ten years, or twenty years from now. Who you are is unique. In all of space, and in all of time, there's nothing quite like you. And economics tells us that the, most, the more rare something is, the more valuable it is. Each of us has priceless value. Don't let it go to your head, though, because every other human does, too. Although, if you're <laughs> captured by slavers, they will assess a price for you. And when you contract to work for someone, you will determine a price for your labor. But philosophically, you're priceless. You're unique. Your opinions matter. And that is what seeing you as valuable does. Seeing that all humans have that value is where freedom comes from. I'd like you to see a movie that's on your YouTube channel tonight. Uh, it's 10 minutes long or less called Powers of Ten. And it shows you, takes you out from a single picnic uh, couple to the edge of the known universe. And then it takes you inside a human cell to the subatomic particles that exist at about one angstrom, uh, which is a really, 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 really small measurement. It was made in the mid-70s, so it has all that 1970s cheese in its music. It won't take you that long. Just view it tonight. I'm sorry, I don't have time to show you in class. But the technical glitches made that impossible. Uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, and uh, periods four, five, and six will get a chance to view this on video. Thank you. Any questions? I see none. You may talk quietly among yourselves. Uh, by the way, don't get up from your seats until uh, I dismiss. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, just, uh, yeah, no, just put them in the period six shelf, which is the lowest shelf on the left. No, period six. You'll see it behind the fan. Yes.